live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's cousin, Diana. Today, we're looking how to suck the fun out of what you love to do or how to not how to blow the fun into it. I don't know. We'll find out, though. Since Paula Pant is on hiatus, we search for the nearest person with the same initials to take her place. Believe it or not, we found her right here in mom's basement. To help you feel better about your own financial situation, today we welcome our brilliant writer, Paulette Perhatch. Joining her at the round table, almost always to win the trivia, we welcome the guy with the best resting bitch face you've ever seen, OG. And we're incredibly excited to introduce you to someone who's going to help you learn to invest in your number one asset, Caleb... Caleb Gilliams. <laughs> now, a guy who adds the fun into any situation, personal or professional, it's Joe Salcihai. You almost made it that time, Diana. I, it's just, I, I really <laughs> hyped myself up, too. I thought it's it was going so Gilliams. Well. Gilliams? Gilliams. Gwilliam, no. Yeah, that you said See, it right. There you go. Gwilliams. But we, yeah, when, I thought that it was like, we removed the U, so the whole script has no U in it now. We, we, we are now, by the way, the we're now, by the way, uh, into uh, 1.2 times. Uh, Caleb's been here and Diana still can't figure out his name. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Friday, the uh, where we learn to pronounce Caleb's name again episode. Diana, how are you doing? Fantastic. Living the dream, Joe. How are you? We, we got, I'm not great because we got a fantastic show. We got Caleb here. We'll say hi to him in just a second. But first, let's say hello to the man across the virtual card table from me, Mr. OG. How are you, brother? Resting. Resting bee <laughs> face, huh? Okay. <laughs> uh, I would like to say that I did not write that joke. No. Diana wrote it herself it based on epic. personal experience. I can't read this guy. Are you happy? Are you not? I just feel like if you smile, your whole head's going to explode. She's very melancholy. I'm the same all the time. Neither high nor low. You're going to, like, I want to make you laugh, but I'm afraid you're going to spontaneously combust. It would be, yeah, it just, it'd be you great. Just have to have funny stuff. You need to work harder <laughs> at it. Burn. Okay. See, exactly. the resting bitch face is coming out to play. And uh, the guy who never has a resting bitch face is here with us again. Caleb Gilliams is here. How are you, man? See, I can do it, I think. Gwilliams? Yeah, you, you, Gwilliams. You, you messed it up, too. But, I, you know. I, you, you, I it's would like Will, to it's, it's Gwilliams. Gwilliams. But it's just Williams. say G at the beginning. Yeah. It's it really the same Quill. name. Yeah. Like Quill. Gwill. Yeah. Then you said guacamole, and I don't understand how that plays the role. Because it's gua. Okay. This is Wee. entertaining radio. This is the best <laughs> beginning of an episode we've ever made. Caleb, so glad you're back. Tell everybody a little bit about you, what you do, because we love it when you come back down to the basement. Yeah, I will. First of all, love being on the show. Life has been incredible. We're actually moving to the great state of Tennessee, so you're going to be a, a, wow. a Nashvilleian, if that's a word. Um, it is now. Yeah. might. TM. And so that's been going well, and BetterWealth.com uh, is is continuing to grow. So we are we're doing workshops. We're adding a tax company. So that's I think new since when last time I've been on here, and uh, all is good. So uh, li life has been great. And, and since I got an invite back on, I'm like that that literally made the highlight of my my quarter because I was like I didn't yeah. make a disaster of my first appearance on the second right. Benjamin show. So thank Caleb, you. Caleb, stop. There's keep still going. time. Stop. Keep going. Right. That's that's why we had you back so we can look stupid trying to pronounce your name. Like that's the that's the, that's the, by the way, OG. How the heck he's got all this stuff going on? He's moving to Tennessee, starting the 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 tech stuff. He's got all this stuff. How does he keep such a cool head of hair when you and I uh, really can't? It probably has a. There's some age difference there. I think between there is. you and him in particular. I think there might be. Normally, you by are the way, significantly older than everyone else here. In fact, I think if you put all of our ages together, we 
we close I in am, on your I, age. I, I, <laughs> let's let's wait for the trivia for for that wisdom to come out. All right. This is what I hate, Caleb, about Len Penzo not being here because now I get the old guy stuff instead of Len. So normally we have our guest of honor as the last person we introduce, but today is a very special day on the Stacky Benjamin Show. Well, it's special for a lot of reasons. Diana's here today. Caleb's here today. But the woman who's going to be today. spending the next, yeah, whatever, the woman who's going to be spending the next 10 months with us, I don't know how we got her to do it. Paula Perhatch is now the new PP on the show. How are you? Oh, my God. Well, yes. If you wanted sound financial advice, you're going to have to wait another 10 months for Paula to get back because <laughs> you just have me. Yes. You uh, I'm write great. very solid financial advice. Come on. You, well, you after write for interviewing brilliant people, I summarize it well as a writer. Don't worry. Uh, I don't know. I'm what very I... happy coming off the, uh, you know, the weekend uh, where I got to see Joe. Uh, at a fancy restaurant, it took me out to a nice restaurant in Orlando, uh, and made the reservation for a week ahead of the day that we were supposed to be there. So that was this great. Is, that's on this brand. Is, this is so. This is so good. The dude can't find our reservation. I'm like, nope. I show him the thing, and he he scrolls. He's like, how come I can't find it? And he, then he looks. He's like, this is for. A week from now, literally exactly knowing exactly how that went down. Joe was like, no, I made the reservation. It's right here, sir, sir, sir. Look, look, sir. Oops. I have a reservation. He's like, yes. you do, as a matter of fact. But we stacked September some Benjamins 30. on that bill. We did. We did. Oh, geez. About to see. Thanks, we Joe. spent a couple of Benjamins that day to celebrate oh, I already saw. being with us. Yes. Oh, it I already was, saw. Uh, yep. Are you trying to tell great. me that it was more expensive than not the shrimp fajitas corporate. that I had at lunch with you guys a few weeks was ago? Not approved through HR. You got to get, the, get that fried so, black sesame mochi at the fancy we, Disney Springs spot. We got to change the topic here. Get away from. <laughs> uh, get away from how much we spent. We got Caleb here. We got Diana. We got OG. We got Paulette. Let's get this party started, shall we? <laughs> Today we go someplace where we haven't been before on the show. It's a publication that I absolutely love. For a long time, I got the print version of Outside Magazine. And, well, this is a piece from OutsideOnline.com. Uh, if you just go to Outside.com. And this is an essay, just fantastic essay, about the nightmares of before turning... Christmas. You no, know, actually, making a nightmare every day when you decide that your passion, this thing that you love, actually becomes what you do. And and I wish I had it open in front of me. Paula, do you have it open, actually? Uh, do you know? Because I really want to tell everybody who this wonderful, fantastic writer is. Oh, Somebody I tweeted has to her open. today. So Caitlin me... Giddings. Caitlin yeah, Giddings. Caitlin Giddings. Great. Thank you very much. It was yes. so well written and so funny, and I'm, I'm a new fan of hers. She uh, loves bicycling and she thought you know what bicycle touring fantastic doing all this stuff i will decide to work in the industry and then now she has this wonderful piece about it begins with uh well a guy in a recumbent bike one of those bikes where you're sitting down and the night before uh he decided that he would secretly ride into town and get two uh 12 packs of old milwaukee and finish them while everybody was asleep because he was so angry about all this bicycle riding they were doing. There was a gentleman who'd had, I think it was a closed head injury, who uh, showed up on like a Schwinn single speed bike. And when uh, when she told him that uh, that might not be the right bike for one of these, you know, long hundreds of miles tour, that um, his mom uh, thrust her finger in her chest and said, he can do anything he wants to, and you're not going to tell him no. And the bike, I think, Paulette broke what, on the first day of the ride? Yeah, or, in or, half, like, yeah. Like the, the preamble of the ride, the bike broke in half. And so she talked about just how miserable turning your passion into, into money uh, is. And yet, Caleb, let's start with you as our guest of honor, man. You hear this all the time. I know, right? People, you're at something, you have a good, you have a good cupcake at somebody's house during some party. And the first thing we all say to each other is, Hey, you should go into the cupcake business. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those things, especially my generation We're we're all about like following your passion. And I, I grew up in a house where it's like, you have to also have be practical with it. 
Um, and so I've kind of, I create frameworks on everything and it's like, we're getting paid for the service or product that we're providing and not all services or products are created equal. And I think that's where I'll leave it at that is a lot of times passion. If it doesn't translate into something tangible, like a service or a product, and if we can't quantify the value that the market will pay for that, um, a lot of times I find these nightmare stories all the time where someone has fun doing something, but it doesn't translate into actual money following that service or product. I want to get back to that piece because I think that's a really important point you make, Caleb. But I want to stick with you for just a second longer, which is, is, is money and helping people with their money. Is that, did you get into this because of passion? Is it, is it, is it the thing that you, you know, geek out about? Yeah. So that's, a, that's a great question. And I, I would say my passion is more tied up in my mission to help people see and reach their highest potential. And so I love, like, I love people. We've had many good conversations that I just light up when I get to talk to people. And when you look at people and what's keeping them from reaching their highest potential, money is maybe not the top one, but it's in the top five for sure. And so it was one of those things where it's like, oh, if I could help someone identify the inefficiencies, roadblocks, friction into helping that's getting in their way to getting to where they want to go, that's massive value. People will pay for that. I'm sure there'll be a market for that. And oh, by the way, if that translates, it's able to serve people in an amazing way. And so I put the passion more in the result of a mission and less of like a, I enjoy making cupcakes. And so I, I'm going to just make cupcakes. So it was more of like, I got passionate about the outcome and result. So I, I think I got a little bit lucky um, because not everyone, it's not as simple across the board. Um, but I would say my piece of advice would be get really clear on the outcome and get passionate about that. And that, that will be a lot easier to sell than like uh, looking at the input. Because a lot of people are like, I like X, Y, or Z. And they're not actually asking the question, will people pay me? Or is there a market? Or is there a perception of value in this input? I want to dig into what you first said at, at the beginning of that, which is that you love talking to people. Uh, OG loves talking to animals. Just a little known fact. Big into big into big into that. Not so big on the people, OG. But we'll we'll go back to OG in a second. Paulette, you have this job which I think you're passionate about writing, right? I mean, how do you how do you stay fresh when this becomes a job? I mean, there's got to be some mornings you wake up and you're like like the dude drinking the two 12 packs of old Milwaukee. <laughs> I don't know if you've been there with old Milwaukee, Paulette, but I know there's got to have been days where you wake up and you're like, yeah, no. No, no, thank you. Well, you know, when I started out, I knew that I hated people. So <laughs> I was going to start there. Um, no, I mean, I, I love what Kayla's saying with, with the outcome. And then I think to add to that, I'm also all about considering the, like breaking down the elements of what you love, right? So in this story, she loved the alone time on the road. And then instead she's surrounded by people. Like, so to me, I think she could have pivoted. And I think this trip, like when you said, turning your passion into your profession is a nightmare. I think it can be a nightmare, totally can be a nightmare, right? So there are some things that I really do not like that have to do with writing, but I try to break it down into, okay, what do I love about this? Like, I love talking to experts like Caleb, like I love people. I love digging into people's stories um, with them and looking at their writing and editing their writing. And, you know, so that's like, that becomes like my coaching program. I don't like the kind of jobs where I have to deal with someone else, but the client is like the secondary person. So they talk to the client, they report back to me. I report back to them. They report back to client. That stuff I hate. I know I hate that, you know? So I think, I mean, I really wake up and I, I love almost everything I do now. You know, I mean, I've been a professional writer for like 20 years now on, on some level. And so really I've tweaked it and tweaked it. And I think pivoting when you have a situation, like she could have said, okay, I love, biking, I hated this. What were the elements I hated? What did I still like? Like I've thought about being a flight attendant. I'm like, hell no, I'm claustrophobic. And like, I would probably like stab someone with one of the stir sticks for the coffee after like three flights. Um, I really do love, I love people. TSA that I love. frowns on that, by the way. TSA frowns upon that. I read, I looked up on it. You are not allowed to gouge people. So I was like, okay, not right for me. And I love to travel and I love writing. So immediately I'm a travel writer. Well, when you're a travel writer in a lot of, in a lot of aspects, like I like to write essays about travel, but if I'm doing, there's some kinds of travel writing where the whole time you're there, you're like documenting. So it's like, you're acting out travel instead of actually traveling. I don't know. So, um, so really just, just considering 
and continuing to pivot. And when you find that something is becoming a nightmare, really reevaluating and taking it back to what was my original vision and how can I get closer to that and what's not working. But this is the problem, OG. What Paulette's talking about, there's a lot of time I know that our ego gets in the way. We had this great idea. We decided to go in the business of travel writing or cupcakes or talking to people or animals or whatever we want to use. And it's not working out. Like, when do you put your ego aside and go, you know what? This is totally not the thing. I think that some of it is a, is a, is a learning that you get as you explore different things. I don't remember where I saw this, but it was very recent. And it was, it was basically like your twenties and, or, you know, midway through your thirties is not meant to be the time to like settle in on one thing is to find out all of the stuff that you wanted that, that just try lots of things and figure out this is the stuff that I like Paulette, like you're talking about. This is stuff that I don't like about what I do. And what, what you whittle down to Joe, you and I use this term all the time, unique ability. And we get that from strategic coach. And the idea is do the thing that you're super, super, super good at that provides value to other people that provides uh, income to you you know, you get some economic benefit from doing it. And, and this is the way that you can tell if it's really the thing that you're meant to do, that you have more energy after doing it than you did when you started it. So mm -hmm. if you're doing something and you're really good at it and it pays the bills and you're exhausted, that's not it. Like that, that those are good things to do also, but that's not your, you know, that's not the, the, the unique thing that that's uh, good for you. And so it's hard to do, it's hard to know that when you're 22 or 25 or probably even 32 or 35, frankly, unless you have lots of different experiences and you start kind of sharpening it a little bit down to here's, here's the thing or things that I really enjoy, really produce value for other people and really produce, uh, energy and economic value for me. And if all of that connects, then you found something, but not often can you do that and, and still also, you know, pay the bills in your twenties and thirties while you're kind of figuring it out, you know? So you have to, you have to uh, spend a lot of time and energy, I think, working on it. It's funny. There's this myth that uh, most creators and new businesses that are really successful are these uh, 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 wonder people in their twenties, right? And, and studies show, though, the most successful businesses actually are created by people in their 50s after they've worked many crappy jobs and got laid off, let's say, from IBM. Like the you know Web 2.0, Web 1.0, both fueled by these big companies laying off these brilliant people. Diana, you left a career and mm. went and created Economy. I yeah. mean, th this was an area you were passionate about. It's it's not cheap to start a new conference. Sure. Like, tell me about that decision to, to wade into the deep end. Yeah. Well, I think the key is that, yes, economy is something that I'm very passionate about. And, you know, there's kind of this love-hate relationship with that you have with your baby when you create a new bouncing baby conference. Because um, you're not, because you're not really, not to cut you off, but you're not really in the business of financial independence with economy. I mean, don't get me wrong, your speakers, the focus is, but you're in the business of negotiating to run a conference. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, this whole conversation really reminds me of this book by, um, Cal Newport, I believe, so good they can't ignore you. And his whole theory is that don't do what you're passionate about. Do what you're good at and then build up career capital that then you can trade for autonomy. And once you have autonomy, never trade it for more money. And that book was really influential for me because I think that I did what I was really good at in my corporate career. I did make more and more money. I mean, I got like 20, 25% raises three years in a row. And once my income got to a certain point, I actually said to them, I don't need more money. I need more time and freedom. Let me work remotely. Let me take a sabbatical and go to Spain and walk the Camino. Let me like, by the way, I'm starting this side business. And really when I started economy, the goal of it was not to, as it was not a side hustle. It was what I wanted to do with my time. If I was actually financially independent and I didn't need to make money. And I think that's the key to like bringing your passion into the world is to not put pressure on it for your livelihood because that's the fastest way to kill it. And so, you know, I took a 40 grand loss my first year, you know, I'm, set to be profitable next year, but this business would never set up for me to make money off of it. 
it, it is evolving to that. Um, especially because I quit my job and I need to make money now because I'm not financially independent, but it was never set up to do that. And I think that's the way to really test if this is how you want to be spending your time, if you would willingly do it with, without actually making any money off of it. Let's go back to my question earlier around metrics. Caleb, what metrics tell you you're going down the wrong road though? Well, I just, I, first of all, just want to say, Diana, 100% agree with you. And I actually had this post the other day that went semi-viral and it talked about wealth. And, and I compared Warren Buffett. He's worth, he's worth over $100 billion. He's over 91 years old. None of us on this call would trade places with him, which ultimately tells you indirectly that we value our life on this earth at the time that we have more than $100 billion. Mm -hmm. And so what is your definition of wealth? My definition is intentional living with your time, with your relationships, with your talents, um, with your resources. And so if that becomes the metric, which answers your question, Joe, if like we get really clear on the metric of intentional living, the goal should be to live that. And so I'm less, I'm less focused on like looking at work and say, I need to follow my passion. I'm more focused on the definition of efficiency and eliminating anything that's getting in my way to living intentionally. And so I'm, I've last couple of years, I've been less concerned about what I'm doing and more about where I'm going. And, and it's really based off of this intentional living. And I would say that you are living a wealthy life because you're clear on what does that intentional life look like and you're now doing things to make that a reality and you don't have to wait till you're 65 or 70 to somehow do that when you would have less energy. So I don't know, Joe, if that answers your question, but I just, um, I was jumping out of my seat to, to, to piggyback up off of what you said because I think it was very articulated um, very well. No, because I, because I like what you're talking about, Kayla, because Paulette, you and I have worked together now for just over a year, and I've seen the difference, I think, in you as a writer, uh, very professional writer versus somebody who's just creative and wants to write, right? That you're, mm -hmm. you seem to be very intentional about your time and, and, and where you place that time. Oh yeah. I mean, and I, I wasted a lot of time. <laughs> I mean, I was just a total idiot for a long time um, until I was about 28 and then I decided to get serious, which is a fairly long time to wait. Um, Me too. So, I was you know, also 28. Yeah. Were you really like 28 this yeah, magic year? 28. Oh man. Caleb, you yeah. turned 28 in what, five years? <laughs> in, in two years. <laughs> yes. Okay. Goodbye, Caleb. Go away. You're, you're off the call. You're out of here. And we gave you a second chance. Everybody's jealous. We're all we're no. all jealous. Yes, but uh, I had a but, great but, time you... wasting so much time. So yeah. So now I'm very intentional, and sometimes, like literally, I will be I'm like, oh, I'd have to work so hard. I was like, because remember what you did in your 20s? That's why. That's why. You know, I'm like the opposite of um, who's that guy who talks always talks about how his friends went to the Jersey Shore. I love him, Gary V. You know, he's like, my friends are all at the Jersey Shore, and I was working. I was like, I was the friend at the Jersey Shore, like. And like no regrets whatsoever, but it's true. So now I have to work a lot harder and, um, and I want a lot of things. So, you know, and yes, yeah, so I get up and I do my morning pages. I meditate for half an hour. Um, and then I work on my novel and I like, I can't imagine what it would be like if I felt any kind of financial pressure, uh, on my novel. And so, you know, I kind of do my creative stuff in the morning and then my goal is to earn the most per hour and be very professional with the services I provide after that so I can make the most per hour so I can buy those creative, that creative time and the time to just like chill with my friends. And I just made a move to, from Seattle to Gainesville to be able to chill a little bit more because I just want to enjoy my life and Seattle is getting so expensive. So, you know, we all That's have to yeah, but that's interesting that you separated the type of writing you do into two different things. Mm -hmm. You've got the writing I do for clients, which is my business, and then the quote cupcakes we were talking about at the top of this segment, you know, is your creative writing that you're doing yeah. for you to feed your soul. I have something called the it's like Paulette's matrix of writing work and the two axes are pay and appeal, right? So it's like sometimes it's a mix, right? Like I might be getting paid a little bit, but I also really like it. Like I write for an art magazine. They don't pay me as much as I charge a lot of my other clients, but I love interviewing artists and writing about art, right? So it is those balance of the Can two. Notice that you didn't say stacking Benjamins in that sentence. I am um, <laughs> being very careful. I'm tiptoeing right now. I don't know if you can... <laughs> hear that in my voice sorry to other clients out. don't pay me well and it's not fun at all and it's horrible mess yes. up dinner reservations and you know it just it's a nightmare but just just too yeah. nice to quit you know um, no, just kidding just <laughs> gotta, kidding. gotta do what she's gotta do total blast I'd, 
I, I think we'll end on that note, <laughs> that, that very positive note. In just a second, we are going to have our second half of this conversation, which is going to be around our best advice. How do you, how do you create that business that really is going to succeed and really bring some passion to it? But between now and then, we've got a segment that's happening all year long, which is our trivia segment. And on Monday, Wednesday, we ask you all stackers a trivia question. But on Fridays, we have our panelist in a year-long fight to the death for the world's best dollar store trophy. And so far, Caleb, well, Caleb, we got some good news and bad news for you, brother. Which one you want first? I'll take the bad news. The mm-hmm. bad news is you're not winning. You're playing on behalf of Len Penzo today, so you are our Len Penzo. You're in second place, though, and you had a great show just before our break. And so currently you have 12 points. OG has 13 and a half because he tied with Paula slash Paulette now. And Paulette, your first time uh, uh, taking over this. You've got even worse news than Caleb Paulette. In the Paula Pant last place. Yeah, yeah Paula Pant left you way behind with uh, oh, eight and a half, eight and a half DFL. points. Yes. <laughs> OG Again. 13 and a half, Len 12, Paula eight and a half. So, How many weeks are left, by the way? Uh, several. Oh, several scientific. Yes. Got it. About the end of yes. the quarter. We have like two more weeks in the quarter. More than so, more than 14. four left in the year. Uh, more than four. All right. But you know what? I don't even know what the trivia is today, but somebody on our team does. I think her name's Diana. You ready to go? Let's do it. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's cousin, Diana. And get this. Today is National Vegetarian Day. There's a holiday I have a beef with, and I'm not chicken to say it. Stick a steak right through my heart if you're not into this holiday. But for people who regularly avoid animals, salted to taste, but still like to eat pretend beef, there's always impossible beef, which is the subject of today's trivia question. While the impossible products seem new to the market, is the company new or old? Here's your trivia question. How old is the company? impossible foods i'll be right back after i keep up with vegans everywhere by heading online and bragging about eating apples you guys have never seen that every vegan i had an apple i ate a banana no i did crossfit that's more people (laughs) yes we see crossfit more often Uh, who do you hang out with that brags about eating fruit i think you need some more interesting friends joe (laughs) That's what happens when you get into your 50s. Brag about the big stuff. Yes. We don't stay up all night I left my teeth in, and I had an apple, and it was okay. (laughs) Or or I had a banana because my teeth were out. (laughs) I was glad to see that Paulette uh, sat through some writing that wasn't hers for that and did not roll her eyes once. That was good. Never. All right. Here we go. It's really, I've been really enjoying, like, I'm on the side where I know what the answer is, and I get to watch everyone else sweat, and now it's my turn. I don't know. It is your turn, but luckily for you, you get to go last because he's in first. Oh, gee, it's going to take first swipe at this. We're going to change this question around just slightly. What year, what year Uh, was it created? All right, let's go with that. That'll make it easy. So Impossible Foods is the company? Impossible Foods, yes, sir. So it's got two words in it that are common in the English language, and that seems to have been around a while. So impossible and foods. So I'm going to say at least since 800 AD, somewhere in there. Um, so let's see, 800 AD plus uh, when did they start grinding crickets up and putting it in your cheeseburger? Uh, 19 and, uh, 91. I have no idea. 1991. 1991. Diana, you're writing these down? I sure am. All right. We got 1991 on Diana's list. Uh, Caleb, what do you think about that? I don't like being in the middle. Gives Paulette a huge advantage. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm going to say, I'm going to say 2004. 2004. So Caleb also think it's been around for quite a while. Well, that's and, because uh, that's what Diana said. It's been around a long time. You just add it. You put in adjectives. 
She Maybe said I'm trying to throw you off. I'm, I think she With said I'm hesitant. I'm making you pick. Yeah. Either, uh, I think Diana, did you say, has it been around for a long time? Let's look at the script. What did you say, Joe? That's the... Uh, <laughs> What that's did, the real question. Paulette's it said, is the this. company new while the impossible products seem new to the market? Is the company new or old? Yeah. M may have stank on that. Just either old. way. Who knows? But Paulette, to Caleb's point, uh, Paula, as brilliant as she is, has been in the driver's seat all year long in last place and hasn't been able to take advantage of it. So, yeah, um, I'm going to go with 2005. 2005, she takes the upside, and that's the way you do it, people, not Paulette's first rodeo. We'd love to tell you who's right, but we don't play that way. We'll be right back. Oh, gee, you kick things off with the only uh, answer that was in the 90s, going way back to the 90s. How you feeling? No idea. No idea. Don't care. Still winning, <laughs> so whatever. You know, the good news is that you're not just in the middle sandwich. Your guess is sandwich. You got like 2004 through what? 2002-ish, I think. I said 91. Or 19, so oh, you said 91. Oh, ish or so. sorry. I got, yeah. Yeah. You got some room. You feeling good? I should have went up. I, I was I was hoping that I was hoping I Paul, Paulette would uh, go under me, but... And my gut is saying that she's going to win this one. That's she, what my gut saying. She took the over. Paulette, you feeling good? Uh, always no. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I don't know. My first, my first impulse was 1995, but I decided to just take the, the upswing. So we'll see. Well, the, if you are feeling good, I will tell you this, Paula Pant felt good every week and rarely got it right. <laughs> so we will see how feelings go right now, Diana. Hey there, stackers. I'm meat respecter and late night food fan, Joe's mom's cousin, Diana. Our question today is about a company that's been hauling in lots of Benjamins lately, Impossible Foods. How old is the company? While Impossible Burgers and Bowls are fairly new, the company's been around for just over a decade, formed in July of 2011, which means that Paulette is our winner. Oh, hey, what's up there? Oh, gee, the, the Paula Pant team brings in a pinch hitter, and look at what happens on week one. It's exactly what I wanted to have happen, because as long as Len doesn't win, I win, because there's no way Paula <laughs> Paula slash Paulette can catch me with, uh, you know, just the fourth quarter to go, so... <laughs> I, is is there enough weeks? I think if she wins every week, she might. Yeah, and if we slide it, it would another be close. game show, it in would there. be close. But I mean, the the you know, I'll the have to, that happening. I'll, I'll have to have one eventually again. I just built but, such a great lead. I don't have to put a lot of energy into these. So cocky, Paulette. You should just mm. win every week. Just not, win every week. I got, I'll work on I'm it. just gonna put the trophy back here. So it's not cockiness when you back it up, bruh. <laughs> we'll deal with that next week. But for now. <laughs> We got a second half of this discussion. Second half of our discussion about your passion and your business or the work that you do. It's brought to you by Magnify Money. Caleb, you know what happens when you go to stackybenjamins.com slash magnify money? You get something amazing. <laughs> I could just see you searching for the answer. Like, oh, God, no. You know what you find out, Caleb? You find that those brick-and-mortar bank products that you probably use if you just walk into your local branch, probably not best in class. Over 92% of all the stuff online, checking accounts, savings accounts, CDs, all ranked head-to-head -head at magnifymoney.com. You go to stackybenjamins.com slash magnifymoney, and that tells them that we sent you, as mom says, with that Midwestern accent. We sent you, okay? Joe's mom sent you. Uh, we... In the second half here, we presented a lot of the problems, and we presented a few solutions and some resources, uh, a good book. Um, but here I really want you guys to dive in with some of your best advice. OG, we'll start with you since you went last in the opening half. If I come to you and I've got a great idea and it's something I'm super excited about because people love the fact that I make great chocolate chip cookies. I want to make a chocolate chip cookie company. What's your first piece of advice to me? 
I would say I think you should make me a dozen chocolate chip cookies, and I will be the judge of that. Just play test. <laughs> like, like, I mean, no, no, you should have an audience, right? Social proof, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've at least a thousand followers on Twitter. So there, there, uh, <laughs> there's that. Um, I mean, my question always when people want to start businesses, regardless of cookie companies or anything is, you know, what's going to be the, the cash flow plan for the operation of the business until you make money, because no matter no matter what kind of business it is, there's going to be a period of time where there's not going to be money coming in. You know, like like whether it's getting the rent for the commercial kitchen and getting the stuff that you need and hiring bakers and you know all that and sales team to go sell your cookies somewhere, you're going to have to invest some capital into a little bit of the proof of concept type of type of thing here. So so. I think a lot of people will get scared when you start laying out the cash flows of like, I might be doing this for a year before, before the money comes. And I don't want, I don't want somebody to look at that and then say, well, I can't do it. So then I would say, well, what's the, what's the least that you can do to see whether or not that there's a product, you know, can you, can you go do a, you know, a, you know, a farmer's market bake sale and just see what happens. Do you sell out every Saturday for, three Saturdays in a row, like, okay, now we're getting some traction, you know, don't go lease the commercial kitchen and hire a whole bunch of people because you're convinced that you're going to be the next Mrs. Fields, you know? So prove it. That would, that would be my advice. Prove it. Prove the concept ahead of time. Uh, yeah. Paulette, when, when you're working with writers, a lot of writers, you know, come to the table ready to write, but how do you, what are your, what's your advice about them starting a writing business? You know, I think definitely focus on not just the writing, but the business aspect. You have to be interested in business. If you're not interested in business at all, then it's not going to be interesting to you. I'm really happy that I am. I think business is like a fun game. You get to win or lose, which is why I give myself commissions because it's like, we I made 50 bucks, you know, like I love that game of it. And I think that there's such a great alignment with, um, with bringing value to people and art. And I think if you understand just the elements of value and, you know, the, um, you know, value to the market and really connecting with people and networking, all these things, you can make your own way with it. So just being a student, not only of what you love and your craft, but business, if you're not willing to do that, then it might be really hard for you to make it. Um, but I think there are so many different ways to go about it, especially now. Caleb. So I, I talked about either a product or services or like the two things that you can sell whether it's to an employer in a business. And a lot of times people get too romantic about the service or their product and they don't re re reverse engineer it and say, who's actually paying me for this? And so mm -hmm. the three things that I would ask somebody if they came to me with a business idea or a product is number one, who who's gonna buy this? Like who, who are those people and what problems do your ideal clients have? A lot of times we, the biggest mistake we make is we, we think our stuff is so amazing and we talk about the benefits, but we don't actually think about the pain of the people that are actually purchasing our product or service. And so what's keeping them up at night? What are, what's making them fight with their spouse? And if you can really understand that and, and then you can salt, speak to their pain and if your product, your cookie, your service or whatnot speak to their, the client's pain, then you have a home run. The mistake I see a lot of people making is there's a disconnect between what you think is valuable to the market. And usually it's because you're speaking your benefits and solutions and it's not translating into actual solving my pain, which will get me to pay, pay money. And that pain can also be translated into opportunity. And so the last thing I would say is like, how, how does that, how does that the supply and demand, is there a demand for this solution? Um, and so, sorry that I, I'm more, I, I the, First two people answered it in a maybe a cleaner way, but I just I think in frameworks and uh, at the end of the day, those would be the three questions that I would ask no. and advice I would give anyone that's going into business. Well, I like that, Caleb, and it kind of points to when you talk about asking those questions. It kind of points to what OG said earlier, which is you may need to play test it if you're unsure of some of these things, right. like on a really small level, yeah. before you pour a bunch of money into this idea. Hundred percent. Yeah, Diana, how about you? 
I'm actually going to offer a dissenting opinion here. Oh. Um, because when I was building the economy conference, I was completely wrong about the problem that I was solving and who I was there to serve. And so I think that when you start something, you need to have a willingness to be wrong and almost kind of figure it out along the way. And I would also say never make something that you wouldn't buy yourself because a lot of people will see a business opportunity, like someone out there will buy this, but if you wouldn't actually buy it, don't make it because you're going to be wrong about your assumptions on, on you're going to build this beautiful plan. You're going to come up with this archetype of your customer and what they want and what need you're solving. And you're going to be wrong. So I'll give you an example. I thought when I started the economy conference that I was contributing to financial literacy. I thought that was the problem that I'm solving. And I thought that college students were going to be so interested in this because when I was in college, no one told me about money. And so if I could just bring the economy conference to the university of Cincinnati and present it to all the students there, they were going to love me. And I was just going to solve all their financial literacy issues. And that actually did not happen. I marketed very heavily to students. I spent thousands of dollars. I guest lectured on campus 30, 30 days before the event. Every single day I guest lectured. I gave them sponsored tickets. I gave them volunteer opportunities. Um, we, I hired an on-campus communication agency. We flooded the campus with 250 posters. We handed out 5,000 flyers. I mean, I spent thousands of dollars marketing to students and I had less than 30 show up. They didn't care. Um, I was not solving the problem of financial literacy. The issue that I solve is that people pursuing FIRE, financial independence, retire early. What happens is that they're lonely mm -hmm. and it's a very isolating kind of endeavor. And so the problem that I'm solving is community as well as inspiration. Um, a lot of times you, when you first discover FIRE, you're like really gung ho about it when you first learn about it. But then when you're five seven years into your accumulation phase, you kind of lose motivation. So you come to economy to fuel the fire. Those are the two problems that I'm solving. And the audience is not students. The majority of the audience is 70% of my audience is knee deep yeah. in their accumulation phase. And 20% is already financially independent and retired. You're going to be wrong when you first make your plan. Is that dissenting, guys? Because I don't really see it as dissenting from what anybody said. I think that's more be willing to pivot. Like, OG, I think what mm. Diane is saying is if you're not, if that play test isn't going the right way, I mean, you got to put your ego aside and go, you know what? The audience might be a little different than what I think it is. Yeah, I mean, there's so many different analogies here, like the, like the, uh, you know, Thomas Edison. I didn't, you know, I didn't, uh, figure out how to do a light bulb. I found 10,000 ways not to make a light bulb type of thing. Sticky so, notes. So there's tons of, tons of, uh, personal tenacity that one needs to be successful in their own entrepreneurial endeavor. Very, uh, very unlikely that you hit it out of the park right out the gate. Um, but you still, from a planning standpoint, I think also need to have different, you know, those different milestones along the way where you say, okay, where, where am I going to check in? to say, am I going in the right direction, right? If you wouldn't have done that, Diana, if you would have just said, nope, it's definitely students. Yeah. You know, you could have double, tripled, quadrupled down on that and had mm -hmm. similar results year after year. But, but you know, what you're saying is you need the tenacity to do it, but you have to have the willingness to to accept that you might got, might might not have it right right out of the gate, which well, is perfectly I think fine also. What, I, also. what I needed to do is... I ended up pivoting to say, I'm going to create something that I want to go to. I'm going to attract an audience and then I'm going to ask them who they are. And so I would do, I did a post event survey and I collected some demographics and the people that actually showed up to my event, I would have never anticipated that that would have been my audience. Mm. And so that I feel like is maybe a little bit more it's, you're not going to get stuck in planning when you approach it that way, create something that you want. And then attract people and ask them who they are. I think we've all, I think we've all, as business owners, everybody uh, here on this roundtable discussion has pivoted to some point, and we heard Diana's pivot. Our pivot, OG, was at the three-year mark. We realized the show wasn't accessible enough. 
like we were talking a little bit too much in jargon and we actually embraced more of the humor of the episode and 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 move the discussion in a way that it would reach a reach a wider audience more more easily because once again we thought we were going to attract a far bigger number of money nerds and instead we were attracting people that were brand new to this and realized that our real role was helping new people realize they can do this like that was that was kind of a a, a big pivot for us uh, Caleb how about for you I, I just think to kind of connect what, what Diana and, and OG said is like a lot of times the biggest mistake I see people making is number one, not asking the right questions, but they run out of money. Yeah. And so if you're in sales or in business and you have like a six month or even a year runway, it, that, that could be that could be tricky. And I know that might be crazy for me to say, but I love when people are doing something and they don't have to make money the first time because then – um, a lot of times you're put in a corner and have to make something work. And, and Diana, what you, what you just did was you pivoted, but you, ha you could pivot mm -hmm. financially. If you had, if you put all of your money into one event and it didn't, it didn't register, it's like you, you're done. And so I think we're all saying the same things, but I think the big mistake people, like I see people make is they watch Shark Tank and they're like, all right, I'm going to go, I'm gonna go quit my job and start <laughs> invent something. And it's like, oh, you didn't think through everything and now you're out of money. And that's not a good sign, you know, and it's, and it's hard. It's funny you say that when I was an advisor, Caleb, I would, whenever somebody would tell me it's going to take X amount of time for this to go, we would double it. You'd triple it. Triple it. You would triple it. Yeah, yeah. I triple it. Yeah. 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 And I, and whenever an entrepreneur tells me how much they make, I divide it by thir a third. All right. <laughs> so, uh, because you all lie. All right. And so, because we're all optimistic, it's all built around optimism. Like you're going to make this, it's going to happen. It always takes more time and money than you think. It's funny you say that uh, big guy in podcasting who runs Libsyn, uh, the people that, that, you know, get to see the insides and of, of many podcasts, Rob Walsh, Rob Walsh told uh, me one time, he's like, I'm the person that sees the real number. And then I see the numbers podcasters tell everybody that they have so many liars and not even little liars, Caleb, like big time liars, like huge yep. liars. Uh, but Paulette, what's a pivot you had to make? Oh, my God. Well, y'all are calling me out like a thousand times over. Number one, I got it. I got an idea for my business from Shark Tank. <laughs> <laughs> number two the first thing i do whenever i like get extra money is like i'm like let's spend it on some new equipment rather than like create more run runway for myself and number three i tend to just not pivot just like add on another aspect of my business so now i'm just running like 10 businesses at once it's going great um but i think you know i had to make a big pivot because the entire magazine industry totally changed over my career, you know? So pivoting just to coaching was a big pivot and deciding like, I mean, everyone, or I guess I should just say not everyone, but so many people who want to be freelance writers, it's like, we have to figure it out between, you know, magazines that are not paying as much anymore and the corporate world. Um, but, you know, I love the book, um, Ask by Ryan. I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, but I think it's Levesque. Um, it's I thought a great it was Williams. one to start. <laughs> it's a great one to start to figure out, you know, like Diana, what you said about really, you know, gathering information and what you find from people and what is surprising. It's, it's such a great book. So that one helps me. Um, and yeah, I think just continuing to allow what's not working to go. I don't know. I think that's a really hard uh, concept, knowing when to let go of something that's not working or to push through. It's tough. Well, well, and that brings up my last question, which I'd love to do like a little speed round of this guys, which is what's a key metric that you follow in your business that you would tell a new person to follow Caleb. Yeah, I, I, I go break even. I mm. now granted it doesn't tell you anything about success, but if you're starting something new, what, what, it, how long is it going to take you to have as much money and you have to value your time into that equation. And so that is like the metric that I care about. And then the next metric is actually like cash flow analysis and profitability, but break even for me is the metric. OG. Top of the funnel marketing type stuff. Like what, what, what can you control to have people hear more of your message? That's that, uh, Diana gets to you. Well, if you go next, but, but that's kind of like, it's going to take a hell of a lot more than 2500 or 25,000 flyers or however yeah. many flyers you said, like, well, what do you got to do to bring it? 
my answer is kind of similar, I guess, to what OG said in that my metric is how do, how many uh, people that come to my conference hear about it through word of mouth? And it's actually half of my audience mm -hmm. hears about it from word of mouth, which says to me, that's really good organic growth and that I have something worth talking about. And so that's my metric. My, my key metric when I started my business that a great mentor told me that was huge was, uh, what does it cost to turn on the lights in my office each day? Mm -hmm. Like for me to just operate, what's my operating cost in a day? And that, by the way, fueled my marketing, right? Because I knew I had to make it X just to just to keep going till the next day. Paulette, finish this off. Um, I'm gonna be an artist and say how it feels. You know, um, I'm I'm getting ready to do this like big karaoke party at um, uh, at this writers conference. I'm writing all these parody songs about being a writer, and the people I'm doing it with they're like this sounds like it's a lot of work for you and i'm like yeah but like i think it might be really awesome you know and so for me it is just like what's the minimum i gotta do to pay my bills to turn the lights on and then to do something that is like really exciting and and seems amazing right like i just want to fund what feels really fun and deep and human and amazing and how my life feels is a major metric for me and really these days i feel closer to exactly what I wanted than ever. And that is great. And that's what I've been building toward for a really long time. You know, I like that as the last statement because we started this with, you can't follow your passion, but once you have all those mm -hmm. metrics, if you can then do what you love to do when you got the key metrics covered, I mean, I think that's a great way to live. Let's, uh, let's end this by talking about what each of you are doing. OG, we're going to start with you. Big weekend this weekend, man. Yeah, I think this is an off weekend, but uh, we got a little family trip this weekend. Gonna go, right. uh, we're going to go out in West Texas and uh, hang out with the fam damnly for a little bit. Fantastic. I love West Texas. Just beautiful, beautiful out there. Uh, Diana, how about you? Big stuff happening th this weekend or what's coming up for the economy conference? Any yeah. big stuff? You've been very active on social media lately. and Well, I hired someone, so she has been very active <laughs> on social media lately. But you've also um, been doing she's... some interviews and some, some fun stuff. Yes. I did launch a new show called Economy Encore, uh, which is about continuing the conversations that started at Economy. And so I'm interviewing um, attendees who are incredibly knowledgeable and generous. Um, and so that is something that I'm working on. But actually, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be with Doc G at Camp Phi. We're both speaking um, wow. at the Camp Phi in California. So I will be spending the next two weeks figuring out what I'm going to say. <laughs> For people who have never been to a Camp Phi, it is so awesome. And for, the for me, and I think I can probably speak on behalf of OG on this one, it sounds absolutely horrible. Like you're at this retreat center <laughs> sleeping on a mattress that's like an inch thick. And it just, I'm like, yep, no, nah, no, nah, I don't think so. But and it's, then I it's went. The, wonderful, the people around you sustain you, Joe. They it provide was amazing. the comfort. It was so amazing. I'm like, oh, great. We're going to sit around and talk about money for three days. I mean, I like that, but is it going to be great with 35 other money nerds? And f what's funny is, is you already know, Diana, having been, you don't talk about money. You talk about values. I mean, you got these Absolutely. great. Absolutely. Usually money, money is just the like gateway of everything else we have in common. So yeah, yeah we do talk about money, but I mean, mostly we True. talk about a lot of other stuff. Yeah. People should look up Camp Fi. Uh, uh, Paulette. What's going on with you right now besides hanging out with us? Thanks for joining our crew, by the way, for the next yeah. um, the next several months. This is going to be a fantastic ride, and we're so happy that you said yes that you'd do it. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here. So starting a new um, cohort of Powerhouse Writers, which is my freelance coaching course, my four-month coaching course. Um, I'm celebrating my second million reader viral essay, and I am getting ready to do a, um, a workshop online about going viral and how it happens and how you can like increase your chances, although you can never um, 
you can never guarantee that. And um, celebrating a piece coming out that started during a Stacking Benjamins meeting. It was Doc G. We were talking about the like sharing economy. And Doc G was like, yeah, you know, you're renting out your like lawnmower and blah, blah, blah. Where does it end? And that got my little uh, weird brain thinking. So I got a satire piece in um, a place called Points in Case called Make Extra Cash by Renting Out Your Mouth. And um, that was just a really fun thing that came out of just an actual conversation. So um, <laughs> that is, yeah, that went off the rails quick. Wow. <laughs> Kayla, thanks a ton for coming back, man. Well, I'm glad we didn't scare you away the first time. That, that's a tough act to follow <laughs> right. right there. So um, after that, what's know. going on at the brilliant Better Wealth show? We're, so we're, we're up in our game as well. We, we've, hired two people since we've last chatted Joe to help us share our message on social media. So I'm going to start vlogging the journey of um, speaking and building better wealth. And so I, I feel like some of the best education is not telling, but showing. And so we're going to be showing the, the good, the bad, the ugly behind the scenes. And so that's going to be on the better wealth channel in, in the next couple months. We're, we're starting filming now. Um, and then also we're moving to the great state of Tennessee and going to live in Nashville and um, excited about that move. What and prompted that? What prompted that, that move? Um, so a couple, a couple things. I'm, I'm married to someone who doesn't thrive in high altitude. So that's, <laughs> that's one thing. Um, and then out of all the states that we looked at, um, Tennessee checked a lot of the boxes and no state income tax was a, was a plus. Plus there's an amazing entrepreneurial group and a lot of good friends in Nashville. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's why, but we're not, I'm not committed. I, I I'm not committed long-term to any one place. i um, so Nashville is the short-term home that might turn into more of a long-term home. Could have been Texarkana, dude. You just never, we never talked. It could have been Texarkana. Yeah. And dodge that bullet. Just, what, 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 easy bullet. What does, what does Nashville have that Texarkana doesn't? I don't know, know anything besides... about Texarkana. I just want to say that. So, yeah. Um, the Black Rabbit is an amazing restaurant in Nashville, Caleb. So. Well, Check we'll have to, I'll, I'll make reservations and make sure that. It's the right, right reservation, right place, right time. Yeah, try for the, the well, week. Try to go the week that your reservation is. Well, that's going to do it on making reservations together. <laughs> the, we have to, I have to pivot away from that again, awkwardly. Uh, big thanks to everybody. Actually, Diana, you've got a bunch of thank yous. But first, I have a question for you, Diana Merriam. Shoot. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, if you want to do what you love professionally, make sure you're not also taking on a whole lot else you're not going to do. You're not going to be too into. Second, if you're going to follow your passion, first get yourself to the financial position where you can pivot when you inevitably have to. But the big lesson, that's it. I've decided I'm not going to do what I love for a living. The cuddle parties will always be 100% free. Cue the applause. Thanks to Caleb. Thanks to Caleb Gilliams. Williams. Thanks to Caleb Williams for joining us today. You can find his work at CalebGuacamole.com and Better Wealth Show on YouTube. Can't spell Caleb Williams because I can't say it. Neither can we. So we can just put a link in today's show notes at StackingBenjamins.com. Thanks to OG and his epic resting bitch face for joining us today. Looking for good financial planning help? Head to stackingbenjamins.com slash OG for his calendar. And a big sacker welcome to Paulette Perhatch, who will join us for the next 10 months. When she isn't with us, Paulette helps writers all over the world stack more Benjamins with their work and put power into their words. Need to write better or make more? Check out her Powerhouse Writers Coaching Program at powerhousewriters.com. And when I'm not stacking Benjamins, I'm planning a ridiculously fun party about money called the Economy Conference. We're halfway sold out for the next event that's happening in March 2023. So grab your tickets at economyconference.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2022, and is written in part by the very amazing Paulette Perhatch. Thanks also to our team of moms who made today possible. Karen Repine juggles the production of this show while raising two. Brooke Miller handles the show notes and creates our amazing newsletter, The 201, you know, while raising a one-year-old herself. Tina 
Eichenberg makes us all look pretty on our Stacking Benjamins YouTube page, and Autumn Seahigh and Gertrude Smith are our social media mavens. Not only should you not take advice from these dorks, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. You know, we talked about businesses and we've heard some doozy businesses from friends. I'm sure you've been either out for a drink and somebody's like, dude, I got this great idea. And you're listening and you're nodding your head. And OG, you and I talked about this before. If you have to say crazy twice while somebody's telling you about their new business. On the second crazy. The second crazy is time to wrap that story up. That's crazy. Wow, that's, that's crazy. Crazy. Oh, that's yes. crazy. Might be might be a horrible business. I had a great idea, by the way, once sitting out around my solo stove. I was uh, just thinking about business, and I think I was en route to finishing a bottle of wine by myself. And I realized, OG, that there was this cool thing you and I could create, this whole series of ebooks called build plan track and i'm like i just came up with it this is just absolutely incredible build plan track and i went and i immediately grabbed my wallet i buy the url build plan track.com because it's those three steps all together i buy it i wake up the next morning and i think it was maybe around 10 30 i'm like this th- th- this seems this this seems like i've heard it before and then I looked up Build Plan Track, and it was a uh, trademarked uh, program that was happening, OG, when you and I were at American Express together. And American Express had created this whole thing that I dreamed up over a bottle of wine many years later. And now I luckily own a unusable URL. URL. Well, the good news is that they don't own that trademark anymore, so now you can do it again. Well, there, yes, we can do it. If it was good for American Express, it could be good for us. Uh, uh, Paula, have you had a good idea before? Yes, I have so many. I have like a collection of, I call them my free ideas. A lot of them are band names and I'm businesses. Those are mostly the two genres. Um, let's go the other way then. How about bad ideas? Let's go bad ideas. Bad ideas. Oh Lord. Um, uh, no, uh, I did. I was selling knives in college. That was one. And then I had a guy come door to door and try to sell me meat. That seems like a bad idea. <laughs> and also the smoothie shop where I was working at wanted us to wear like Hooter short shorts. I was like, for smoothies? Like, no, no, no. So sexy smoothies, I think is not a good business idea. A sexy smoothie idea. Oh, gee, it's taken. Apparently, Paulette Sorry. thinks that's a Yeah, put some that's a pants on, OG. The oh, gee, was just telling me. My We're trying to make Duke it sound right now, as a matter of fact. Yeah. We're trying to make <laughs> it happen. Just from the chest up. You guys have no idea. Oh, I have an idea. Just thrown up in my mouth as we talk. <laughs> Caleb, I would think you've never had a bad idea. I've had plenty of bad ideas. Um, I, I would say the first business that we, so I actually pursued with someone when I was in high school were these fireproof sign uh, you know how like universities and schools have to have like a those um exit like map of how to exit a building if it's on fire um it's like we're required to have it and they're all like made out of pi- paper if so if you think about that it's like that's kind of yeah. dumb because if there's actually a fire it's going to get burnt up but it's just kind of like a you know a technicality and so the idea was 
fireproof steel, you know, exit signs that looked great. And, you know, everyone would be super excited because they would put it up and it would be fireproof and all that. Um, it didn't get a lot of traction. Let's just put it that way. And, and we realized that most, most, most people have that because of regulation, not because anyone, no one's looking at the sign if the fire's happening. They're just checking a yeah. box. The company's checking a yeah, box. They're checking they a box. So it, yeah, so it was, it was a really good experience and we had a lot of fun in the process and I'm grateful for, I'm grateful for the idea and the, all, all the things I learned in, in making signs that no one wanted to buy. Diana? I think that all of my kid businesses, first of all, where was my mother? Um, all of the businesses I came up with when I was a kid were awful. Like I used to draw pictures and like go knock on everyone's door and try to sell them this picture that I drew. And like, I remember this one mom was like, she was so sweet to me. I mean, I was like eight or nine years old. Where was my mother? I'm like knocking on strangers doors. And I remember she said to me like, this is so beautiful. I can't take it because like my son, if he sees this on the fridge, it's so much better than the stuff he draws. So like, he'll be really jealous. So yeah, that was a bomb. Um, and then what I, a great I a, objection, by the way, like if there was like know, an objection was, handling course to try to overcome that objection, like these people, you know, that like when I was in sales in college, we took all these courses about how to handle all these objections. So if if you're selling pictures and somebody says that it, your picture is too good. Yeah. I walked away from that. Like, okay, I'll take it. I'll take a compliment. Um, and I remember there was this other time I had like a big jungle gym in my backyard. And so all the neighborhood kids, we'd all like play in my yard on the jungle gym. Well, I decided one day that I should start charging for this. I wanted to create like a social club in my backyard and it was a fenced backyard, you know? And so of course my clientele has no money and speakeasy, this is like a speakeasy jungle gym. Yeah. And so I'm trying to charge membership fees and all my friends didn't have any money. So then it was just me by myself on the swing, looking out at all my friends, like playing running bases and baseball in the street. And, uh, and so they all just moved on without me, but yeah, trying to charge them to, to play on my jungle gym was, uh, was not a, it was a very bad idea. Oh, gee, there's no way either you've had a bad idea or somebody's told you a bad idea. Um, the, the only one that comes to mind that we, we just never did anything with, and I actually think it would have worked, uh, had I had any energy or interest in making it happen was, um, uh, like we have, uh, a family cottage in Michigan that we go to maybe two and a half weeks a year. And the rest of the time, all of our stuff is up there. And by stuff, I mean, boats and jet skis, like it literally sits there 50 weeks out of the year, two weeks. We do with, we, you know, we have fun. And they, like we have jet skis that are like seven years old that have 50, 50 hours on them total. <laughs> it's like, no, it never gets used. And so I thought, I was like, there's probably a way to like create like a, like a Turo for jet skis during the entire season of jet skiing time, except for like the two weeks that we're there. And, um, I just never got around to it. So, I, but, but I suspect there's copious amounts of, uh, insurance requirements and you know lots of other hiccups to deal with and so otherwise all of my ideas are great does anybody have a friend that told them a bad idea where you're like nodding your head and you're like oh this is a freaking disaster i do but it actually turned out to be gangbusters it worked. was terrible so my friend who she's my best friend erin she's the only other person i know that has full autonomy over her time so we hang out a lot and uh, she started making in her garage squirrel picnic tables. Have you seen these? They're like yeah. these little picnic tables where you put a corn a cob like a corn on there, and you like stick it into a tree, and the squirrel sits at the table and eats the corn. It's like super cute. And so she started she started making them because she saw that that they were doing like sixty grand a month in sales on Amazon. And she ended up making like six figures off of selling squirrel picnic tables on Amazon. I mean, it was a fad, so it had a, like a product life cycle to it and it kind of phased out, but like she, she did well. Wow. It seemed like a crazy idea. We made one of those for OG. We put like corn on a table <laughs> and we sit around. It's so cute watching him eat. Cute little guy. 